Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank first by thanking you all for being here today. Um, I'm happy to be here. I know it's a, quite a bit of a nasty weather today, really. I'd like to thank in particular the CRDP and the law faculty of uh, Université de Montréal for providing this occasion, and special thanks to uh, my colleague uh, Valentine uh, for her un unfailing assistance in terms of the administrative coordination, uh, uh, and also to Victor uh, for suggesting me to take up the spot in the first place. Uh, it is very appreciated, and it goes without saying that I would not be here uh, if not for the continued support and guidance of my doctoral supervisors, uh, Monsieur le Professeur, Le Doyen de la Faculté, uh, Jean-François Godot de Bien, et Madame la Professeure, Nora Karazifan, et Nora qui est là d'ailleurs aujourd'hui. Merci d'être venu. Merci. Now, I, I do admit, I, I do admit that I hesitated quite a bit in the in the process of um, trying to narrow down the, the subject, which subject to talk about today. Uh, uh, well, first I had to take into account the, the obvious limited time that's been given to me, but also I wanted it to be something that's very much d'actualité, uh, so that you know everyone can uh, somehow relate to, or at least have an honest opinion about. Uh, and that hesitation is extended to, to the exact wording of the, the conference, uh, if you noticed. Uh, and I wanted to tread carefully so as to not appear too politically uh, excessively biased or motivated either way. Uh, and, and don't worry, today's conference is not some personal manifesto about what's going on with our dear neighbors uh, across the southern borders. But if anything, if anything, I really do think that the legal treatment of racial group defamation, of hate speech, of hate propaganda have really become relevant in the current uh, political and social climate. And I'm also of the opinion that uh, this it's not so much about a single man, uh, and I think we all know who I'm referring to here. It's not so much about a, what a single man may or may not have, or may continue to do in, in terms of the damage in both national and international reputation, really. Uh, but I think it's more about this collective state of disregard that goes on uh, in terms of the, the harm that goes on in our society. Uh, this, uh, this process, if you could say, uh, of normalization, justification, uh, in terms of the civility uh, where certain lines that should remain uncrossed are crossed when uh, disparaging an entire group of people based on their fundamental uh, characteristics, uh, painting them nefariously uh, with a large brush we, without offering uh, any sort of critical distinction and to somehow suggest that that act is justified uh, because that's just how today's politics have come to work. It, sometimes it really is a sorry uh, sight to see. Now, before I lay out how today's conference will unfold, Two things to note uh, very briefly, in particular, mm, for the sake of clarification. First, to the term vilification. Vilification is not a legally defined term per se. It's not some part of legal codex. It's not given a legally recognized status by civil criminal law. Uh, like it's the case for uh, hate propaganda or group defamation, uh, at least here in, in the Canadian law. But in today's conference, I would like to use the, the notion of vilification in the light of group defamation. And there are two reasons for that. For one, vilifying a group of people ultimately results in tarnishing their social reputation within the community where they reside. And in that regard, it, it does really share a common ground with the law of defamation. The law of defamation primarily seeks to protect uh, one's uh, social esteem, social consideration. And secondly, because group vilification inevitably involves maligning a group of people uh, based on their natural uh, characteristics and has this effect of exclusion from the larger society. So again, there's undeniably this uh, collective dimension that is another common denominator uh, with group defamation. And on top of that, we're not just talking about some, some minor attribute to a group of people, but the denigration is really is fundamental in the sense that it's based on what a lot of political theorists or anthropologists have commonly referred to as 
the primal, uh, primordial affinities, uh, those natural characteristics that really do define uh, a person, that person's identity, and that regardless of the victim's willingness to be, to, to be identified or belong to that group of people. For instance, a man does not have a say in being born a black or a white man. I, for one, did not have a list of options before me when I was entering into this world that I was being born into a family of South Koreans. Um, authors like Harold Isaacs and uh, Charles Taylor, they really do uh, talk about this, this um, moment of entering into this world with supposedly a baby, supposed to be a blank page, but at the moment of entering into this world with this uh, extremely rich cultural and contextual baggage, the family's status, family's, uh, the, the birth, the place in society, and which kind of society uh, they, they are li living in. Also to be noted is that group defamation, although today, yes, we are talking about racial group defamation, uh, that, that uh, ground for vilification can be based in other fundamentally discriminatory grounds, such as, well, the obvious one, the most popular one really is religious affiliation. Uh, it can also be based on nationality, it can be based on ethnicity, uh, especially what's going on with the, the Rohingya uh, Muslim minority group in the nation of Burma, what the United Nations have uh, recently referred to as an act of uh, ethnic cleansing. But today I decided to talk about this racial attribute, well, because I think it's well established throughout history and we continue to see its pervasive effect uh, in today's society. The difficulty, I should say, the, the inherent difficulty with group vilification, that it's a speech that is tainted with, uh, with generalization. It is vague in its formulation. And this is partly as to why the subject of group uh, vilification or group defamation is not so much of a popular topic in legal academia, uh, even within the, the, the very inner circles of First Amendment uh, theorists, because there is this reluctance on two fronts. First, on constitutional level, to somehow suggest restricting the freedom of expression, uh, something as fundamental as free speech, based on an expression that doesn't even name its own target, will be absurd. And secondly, on a more technical legal aspect, um, courts have traditionally relied on the size of the group to, to determine uh, whether or not there was uh, harm, that's the result, direct result of group vilifying or group defamatory speech, uh, that there is this harm on a personal, not regardless of the intimate nexus or connection that the victim may share with that group that has been vilified. And I'm not here by attempting to somehow undermine the, the, the fundamental significance, the importance of, of freedom of, of expression really is a fundamental freedom. Uh, it is, as it is often said, the bloodline, the breath of our democratic system. What I'm trying to achieve in this conference, at least, however, is uh, inviting ourselves to a, a careful self-examination, some sort of an introspection, really, uh, by inviting us to, to look at the other side of the portrait when there's certain people who hide behind this constitutional uh, shield, if you could say, of free speech to advance real damage, real harm to, to, to other people and not be held uh, responsible for their actions. Now, having said this, that was a long intro. Having said this, uh, today's presentation is divided into two parts. The first part is more of a general illustration of the kinds of harms that can be purported by racial uh, group vilification. And we'll see the different effects of speech harms and why it really do matter to acknowledge them on both individual as well as social uh, levels. Um, and the second part involves understanding this harm, approaching this harm using deploying the relational approach. Uh, I think it really will be illuminating in grasping the harm and to support my argument that there really is this interconnectedness, that there is really this correlation uh, in these types of speech between the speaker the victim and the society as a whole. So, 
let us jump right into it. I, I begin with the case of Kickstra. Kickstra, of course, it's a very famous decision back from the 90s. Uh, it still remains to this day the, the leading, the landmark decision in the constitutional treatment of a group hate propaganda uh, here in Canada. Now, if you recall, just for the sake of the context, very quickly, James Kickstra was a uh, high school teacher from Alberta, where he propagated his hateful views about Jewish people. Uh, he would say all these nasty things, how they were sadistic people, treacherous, or even child killers. He, he said all these nasty, nasty things. Uh, and he would, he would talk about this grand conspiracy for how there's this, you know, grand uh, conspiracy for Jewish people to perpetrate into our major social institutions, uh, into media, university, government agencies, and so on and on and on. What's so disturbing about the case of Kickstra is that he used his position as a superior over his students to propagate his hateful views about, about the Jewish people. Uh, he would use the most basic reward versus punishment system to, for his student high school students to mimic and parrot his hateful views about Jewish people. Uh, and when that came into light, he was fired, he was let go, and then later on he was uh, charged and convicted under Section 319.2 of the uh, Criminal Code uh, for uh, intentionally promoting hatred against a group of identifiable people based on their uh, ethnicity. He later on, of course, appealed. Uh, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, where he argued that his freedom of expression had been infringed, uh, uh, but that he, he lost his appeal. Now, there are several reasons why this case of Kickstra is so important, but uh, for, for the concise purpose of this conference, uh, I think the case of Kickstra is relevant because it really distinguishes itself by actually focusing on the harms that uh, racist hate speech uh, may inflict. It is refreshing because it really does liberate uh, itself from the more traditional positions uh, where normally in those types of cases it almost almost always becomes some sort of a, a state versus uh, an individual or a constitutional freedom versus another uh, fundamental freedom uh, type of situation. Instead, I think Kickstra really moves the cursor and transposes this, this angle uh, on the harm that the victim of a racist hate speech must endure. And there are two kinds of harms that repetitively appear in the case of Kickstra. Uh, the harm first appears on the individual level, as the then Chief Justice Dixon uh, points out that there can occur, and I'm quoting here, emotional damage that may be inflicted by such category of words and how they can have grave psychological consequence and that it assaults the very sense of human dignity and his sense of belonging to the community. And the harm is also, uh, the harm occurs on the social level uh, because there is this accumulation of harm in the continual, and I quote, derision hostility in the views that's encouraged by hate propaganda that can project a really negative image about the victim as well as the associated group. So in Kickstra, by attempting to see the harms in group vilifying expression uh, from the shoes of the victim, the court, I think, has a relatively easier time to, to grasp and understand the depth of the wound. I, and I personally think it really is an effective methodology to kind of smoothen out uh, the rigid, uh, formalistic edges of uh, a fairly complicated uh, filler law by inviting a more humanistic approach to really understand the kind of harm uh, that's at stake. This transposition of perspective uh, resonates with critical race theorists, of course, uh, on racist uh, hate speech back from the, in, in, the, in the 80s, uh, all, all the way throughout the 90s. Uh, it's an area of study that's uh, very well documented. Uh, critical race theorists like Professor Richard Delgado, Charles Lawrence III, uh, and Mary Matsuda, uh, for instance, they have extensively written on the, on the harm on racist hate, uh, hate messages. And they rely on this psychological uh, medical and social science experts who really do provide and base your uh, arguments on empirical results that highlight the many immediate as well as the long-term effects that the victims may suffer as a result of being exposed to racially charged speech. For instance, the victim may suffer 
extreme emotional distress. The victim might question his sense of worth. The victim can adopt antisocial behaviors uh, that can result in further isolation and humiliation. In the extreme cases, the victim is pushed to opt out for alternative es escape routes, such as the abuse of uh, drugs and alcohol substance. Uh, also, racist speech injures the person's ability to form and develop uh, normal relationship bonds with a group of his own racial and ethnic groups. Uh, it disfigures the victim's relationship uh, with his own people uh, because the victim may come to reject his own natural characteristics that can result in self-denial, in alienation, or because of this defaced sense of self-worth and of the cultivation of self-hatred uh, through being a repetitively predisposed uh, reminder as if he belongs to some lower class of people, uh, almost like a case system. And I can uh, attest to this firsthand from my childhood experience or trauma, if you could say, when I was growing up back in Africa as a son of a Presbyterian missionary. Uh, whenever I go to school, sometimes I would just walk out in the streets, the local children, or locals would surround me, make a, make a giant circle behind me and my little brother, and you know, call us by belittling names and make noises that are supposed to sound like Chinese, but that's not really Chinese, because I'm not Chinese. <laughs> it almost reminds me of the, that, that famous scene, if you watch the Game of Thrones, um, when the, the Queen Mother, Ceci uh, Lannister, is doing her walk of atonement uh, when she's stepping down from the stairs, and then the, there's these people shouting, uh, shame, shame, shame. Uh, so, but at the time, I was, of course, too young to, to realize what was going on, the kind of harm that was being inflicted. But as I grew up and went through puberty, and to this my, uh, day in my adulthood, I gradually realized uh, it becomes clearer and clearer through self-education, uh, and obviously the, the subject of my own doctoral thesis, uh, the various analysis of human psychology, uh, and I realized that I have I, I do admit that I have significant difficulties in maintaining and developing uh, certain social relationships with my own South Korean group of people uh, living abroad uh, because there is this constant backlash of self-shaming, of projection, if you could say, of negative identity uh, that's still living and being inflicted upon my past self. Now, in the face of these hard facts, uh, there still are those who continue to be a staunch supporters of First Amendment romanticism, if you could say, uh, regardless of the, 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 the actual harms that can be uh, caused by your speech. There are, of course, many popular, uh, very well elaborated justifications of this. Uh, I'm gonna name just a few uh, for the sake of examples. That, for instance, that more speech is the solution and not less speech. And that you, too, can always talk back. Or that offensive speech must be given put, uh, constitutional protection, regardless of the damage that they cause. Because once we start going that road of imposing restrictions and uh, regulations on speech freedom, that slippery slope will inevitably lead us to the death of democracy itself. And that ultimately, tolerance, that's the value that we all cherish in a liberal society, is required to even the most heinous uh, contents that some speech may contain. And that, too bad, it's the, just the price that we, we must pay to be able to live in a, in a free and open society. These assumptions, many of them, uh, are unrealistic, if not uh, extremely uh, egocentric. For example, the argument that more speech is the solution and, and not less speech, uh, that argument is not necessarily correct because letting loose racist group hate uh, propaganda, vilification run rampant, doesn't necessarily guarantee that those speech will diminish. In fact, if left unchecked, there is real potential that the harm will mushroom, uh, to quote uh, the infamous coin reports, uh, that the harm will only double, triple, and continue to multiply, because there is, that is just the very nature uh, that is the very mechanism of how group targeting speech works. Uh, it's like throwing fire in the, in the wildfire of public opinion. Also, the argument that 
oh, he's just blowing off some steam, you know, it's, uh, it's blowing off some stress. That is an inconsiderate assumption because there is real harm that is being inflicted to the person to which those racial comments are being directed at. And to somehow suggest, oh, you're not a mute, you know, you can always talk back to that argument is unrealistic in the sense that because in practical life, racial remark is essentially, it can be equated to a slap on the face. It's like spitting on somebody's face. That can most likely uh, provoke irrational and even violent reaction from the victim. And it also doesn't take into account that very often victims of uh, racist hate messages are members who belong to minority groups. So the uh, quote unquote power to talk back is not that powerful after all. Uh, they can simply be silenced. Uh, by the more loud and powerful voices. And this really hints at the more uh, antagonizing uh, problems of this so-called marketplace of ideas, the leading classic American uh, free speech paradigm, uh, which is very capitalist, uh, famously formulated by uh, the great jurist Oliver Wendell Holmes. The problem is the powerful, the rich, the dominant will simply drown out the more fragile voices. And sure, tolerance is the best friend of liberal society, but racial group vilification uh, category of speech, uh, it's that very enemy. You could say it's the bête noire of uh, multiculturalism because it paints an entire group of people who live with us, among us, sometimes at the very perimeter of our own society uh, without offering any sort of critical distinction. Uh, and lastly, the opinion that it's simply the, the, the dear price that we have to pay to, to be able to live in a free democratic society. That argument is, in a way, extremely selfish because, if, again, if you think about it, very often the victims of, uh, of people who, who, who are ex exposed to uh, racial group vilification or hate messages tend to be almost always uh, members uh, of minority groups. So it's, again, the most powerless who are devoid of the necessary political resources who have to disproportionately carry the burden of tolerance of free speech. The burden is not equally shared. As Mari Matsuda, one of my uh, most respected uh, critical race uh, theorists, once said, free speech without equality is meaningless. Now, to, we move on to the second part where I argue about this existence of interconnectedness between, in, in such a uh, category of words, between the speaker, the victim, and the society as a whole. And I partially derive my inspiration from Professor Jennifer Nadelsky from the University of Toronto uh, and her relational approach to the visualization of ourself and regarding the law. But I think in, in this case, the best way to illustrate my points is through a story. And it's an actual story that occurred to me uh, last winter. It was a very cold morning uh, last winter, very cold, a bit of snow virtually. Uh, at the time, I was living in the, in the charming plateau area, uh, de Royal, and I was heading to the RBC, Royal Bank of Canada branch, in the, located in the eastern Laurier. Uh, it was very cold, but I headed there because I had some personal business to attend to. But when I got there, there were still a lot of people already waiting in line uh, to conduct their usual bank business. Uh, after patiently waiting in line for about 12, 15 minutes, my turn to be received was finally near immediacy. Uh, as the lady before me was wrapping up business and, and take, uh, she was carrying a purse away, and as I was just about to step up to claim my righteous place, because well, I waited for about 15 minutes, this elderly man who had entered the building uh, just about two, three minutes ago, he so audaciously, uh, so sneakily cut the line and inserted himself in front of me, effectively taking my own spot. So, of course, initially I was dismayed, I was annoyed, I, I'm not gonna lie, uh, by his blatant and such, such masterful uh, uh, course of events. But, you know, considering his aged appearance, uh, you know, I, and I was not particularly in any hurry, I decided to let it go, you know? I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it, you know? Uh, the interceptor was wearing the, the, the traditional orthodox uh, 
uh, Jewish uh, clothes covering from his head to toe and the length of the hair that matched his, uh, that, that look. And it was safe to assume by invoking human common sense that you know, he was a person of Jewish ethnicity. That is when, that is when the, the, mister was, uh, the mister was waiting just behind me in the line, catching a glimpse of my short-lived and unmistakable moment of annoyance, approached me from behind. Uh, from my left side, and with a smirk on his face, murmured to me, Oui, les juifs sont comme ça. <laughs> so, why do, I, why do I tell this story? Why do I narrate this story? After all, isn't it true that we need all kinds of people uh, who may say, shout truly nasty, hideous stuff in this world? I mean, things far nefarious can be seen in the comment sections of news articles online, and it can be heard in grocery store, in airports, I mean, virtually in uh, most ordinary day-to-day -day basis. We have become over-familiarized and even hardened when exposed to this speed type of speech and quickly learn to you know, shut our minds off. Uh, what used to be forbidden words when we were young kids are now fragmented, uh, really, reminders of the harshness and bitterness uh, of what real life throws at us. And interestingly, this type of speech flourishes in subtlety. In fact, it would be, at least for me, quite, quite a charge to, to, to legally qualify what the man said behind me, that utterance as an ethnically discriminatory group defamation or even hate speech uh, to an extent. Although, yes, it was pronounced in a public square in the bank, but the soft murmur, the, the overall volume, the discreet manner, and the direction to which they were spoken clearly indicated to me, at least to the listener, uh, myself, that the speaker intended me to be the only private audience to what he had to say. The content and set of vocabularies that were used did not include any commonly employed degrading expressions about a Jewish person. And when viewed comparatively uh, with some of the other outright uh, discriminatory and highly uh, offensive speech, such as the N word or the K word, you know, I could say that, you know, what the guy said, that particular phrase was one of the milder ones, huh? one of the milder ones. But be that as it may, be that as it may, then one, one can ask, where, where is the harm in this instance? I tell this story because this is seemingly insignificant, almost average uh, event unearths the interconnectedness of harm in blindly strapping words. The harm here is interrelated between three players, the person uh, who spoke those words, the speaker, the target and the listener, the audience, the innocent bystander, if you could say, which was myself. First, the harm is the speaker to himself. Surprisingly, there's real possibility that for saying that kind of thing, he's tarnishing his own social reputation. His freedom of expression through which he wishes to achieve a higher sense of self-autonomy is minimal at best because they are derived from low human aspirations. To, to echo the classic paradigms of American free speech, his expression does not contribute to the competitive marketplace for such of truths, nor is it productive in advancing a democratic conversation in a society that is inhabited by a pluralistic uh, people. And secondly, and most obviously, the person to which uh, to whom this speech was casted at, he suffers. And in this context, it doesn't really matter that the elderly Jewish man was not aware that the man behind me was talking ill of him uh, from behind. Uh, the comment was aimed not just for his ounce of incivility, but it attached that incivility as some sort of a natural package deal to his ethnic identity. The victim effectively saw his, the perception of self denigrated. And thirdly, the net of the harm catches me, the bystander, as well. The insinuation, uh, bref, in the expression of the, the speaker was effectively that, you know, Jewish people have no respect for keeping order, civility. They skulk by nature, and they will not hesitate to conduct themselves in a furtive, surreptitious manner to get their person's personal business done. So the speaker's depiction of the Jewish people as selfish, disrespectful, underhanded people, while it's doing it's effectively polluting the audience opinion about Jewish persons. The next time the bystander, the supposedly innocent 
bystander comes across a Jewish person across the street, uh, on a television screen, the first thought that will cross his mind is the image of this negatively depicted uh, elderly Jewish male along with all the undesirable qualities attributed to him at the moment of the encounter at the bank. So the speaker, in a way, would have successfully perverted the social esteem of all Jews from at least the bystander's point of view. And that is the pervasiveness and the, and the harm uh, of hateful words that are that are combined with this generalization. It discolors society's eyesight. So as the analysis of the story demonstrates, the harm really is interconnected. There is this flow, this exchange of harm that is propagated by the vilifying remark of the speaker. The speaker's autonomy and self-consideration, the target's degraded status uh, and injured dignity, and the bystander's blackened mind. And consequentially, the countless would be casualties subjected to that very discoloration. All negatively affect each other. In the grand scheme of things, everyone is a, is a victim. But we have to be clear here. While it's true that group defamation or group vilification is not in of itself the cause of mass persecutions based on identifiable characteristics, however, a reasonable man understands that there is this connecting thread between the inflammatory public rhetoric targeting a group of people and the rise of hate crimes against those very same people. Uh, it is tricky in a way because that, that, that thread, that connection, is not something that can be pinpoint, uh, pinpointed out with, with the empirical evidence uh, that can be cooked up in a, in a science lab, but to somehow suggest that there is absolutely no link no correlation whatsoever between the white supremacist march in Charlottesville we saw recently, and the leader of that country, uh, his deafening silence, who is supposed to be de facto the, the moral leader of the country, uh, who somehow suggested this some sort of a moral equivalency between the white supremacists and the left activists who are denouncing that racism that de defies human common sense. So all in all, I will conclude on this. I know I'm kind of running uh, out of my time. Well, we end up building walls, pun intended, obviously, here, yeah, <laughs> of indifference to keep out the harm. And we go on about our daily lives with our heads in the sand sometimes. Uh, we pretend that the harm is not there, but the harm has not gone anywhere. It's just that we have grown, we've grown uh, really familiar, too familiar, and grown, uh, really forced ourselves to, to develop a particular sense of dullness at the sight of group debasement. The harm here is even more acute because the harm in remaining as passive tourists and the harm that's being inflicted at the most vulnerable groups of people uh, around us is clouded by the fake sense of self-reassurance as members of the dominant group, since there is almost little to no risk uh, of enduring the kind of vilification those others, they submit them the, themselves to. This is because the persons sitting comfortably in the security of the political majority do not face the, kinds, uh, the same kind of threat that members of minority groups face. The dominant class can afford to ignore or overlook the harm because they possess the necessary political means to turn around the table as they see fit, whereas the weaker groups have to remain in permanent vigilance to keep an eye for their fragile state of interests and rights that can so easily be trampled upon or negotiated away at the mercy of the dominant. Mem members of the minority group simply do not have the luxury, uh, if you could say, to, to gamble with what J.S. Mill so famously said, the tyranny of the majority. There is a heaven and earth difference between a society where racial group vilification flourishes in the silence and the reluctance of the law and the community where such calumny that is one unworthy of human dignity is perceived as harm to one equals harm to all. So allow me to close this conference with a quotation from Jennifer Nedelsky's Lowe's Relations from uh, uh, the, the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, First, they came for the communists, but I was not a communist, so I said nothing. Then they came for the social democrats,
But I was not a social democrat, so I did nothing. Then came the trade unionists, but I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, but I was not a Jew, so I did little. Then when they came for me, there was no one left who could stand up for me. Full full thought. On that note, thank you very much for coming out. I really do appreciate it. It's a, it's a wonderful weather outside. Uh, on that note, if you have questions or just comments uh, for the for discussion, uh, please do so. But on that note, thank you again very much. Thank you.